write poetry. Eileen Miles' 1991 collection, Not Me, contains unca uncharacteristic of many poetry books, a short epilogue of perhaps poem at the back entitled How I Wrote Certain My Poems. Whilst for a writer to switch from poetry to prose, or accompany a poem with a note or addendum, or some sort of qualified statement, is not uncommon. The particular composition's title strikes me as rare and honest, and in a way beautifully modest. A magician never reveals his tricks, and a workman never blames his tools. Poems are often shrouded in mystery, and deliberately kept so, obfuscated so as to hover between all the meanings they might not mean. One of the primary rules of creative writing class is the maxim, show not tell, and here Mars tells us exactly where some of her poems came from, like a newly endowed couple playing you their home videos. However, what's really beautiful or alluring about this piece is that you can read it multiple times and you still won't be able to pinpoint the moment of conception. There's one bit where she says, there's a line in this poem, Hot Night, that I'd like to explain. I can't because it is not beautiful and I'm a ward of the state. I meant the state of beauty. I'm a ward of the state of beauty. Later on, explaining the genesis of the different news who she's talking to, she says, Missing you is not possible in the New York rain because your name is caught between the drops. It's chiefly romantic. Talking to the obsession, the garden lover. I guess she's everywhere there's nothing. Poetry is everywhere there's nothing and nothing is everywhere, in high oscillation between the possible and the real. Sometimes the poetry can be given the exact formula and it will still shock you. Plato, in the 10th book of the Republic, famously banished poets from his ideal city. Attempting to define an aesthetic theory, Plato suggested there be three different levels of representation related to the figures of God, the carpenter and the painter. The example he gave to illustrate this was that of the bed. If we think of a bed, we think of a bed in the platonic mental realm, not necessarily existing in the world, but nonetheless a prototype for all the beds that do exist in the world. This is the first level of representation, which is the ideal, the bed in nature, the purest and truest form of bed, as created by God. The next level of bed is that made by the carpenter. God only made one bed, the prototypical bed, for we only associate with the word bed one concept. When the carpenter makes a bed, whilst giving it a certain material form, he is merely recreating an appearance of this ideal bed. It is therefore out removed from its first level. The painter, however, does not make a bed, but simply makes an image of it, or in Plato's terms an imitation. He is therefore three times removed from the king and the truth. Poetry, and explicitly tragic poetry, as the least useful and most rhetorical of the arts, should be banished for it corrupts citizens from the good and the true and risks encouraging immoral states of mind. Poetry has no relation to reality itself, and yet, and this is what Plato seems to fear, may still be mistaken for reality. In 1922, Danish physicist Niels Bohr was awarded the Nobel Prize. Bohr is today most famous for his work in quantum mechanics, developing the principle of complementarity. This holds that items can be separately analysed as having several contradictory properties. Electrons can behave like both waves and particles. Objects governed by quantum mechanics, when measured, give results that depend inherently on the type of measuring apparatus used. They have no intrinsic properties. To quote Karam Barad, a theoretical physicist and feminist theorist based in California, according to Bohr, the central lesson of quantum mechanics is that we are part of the nature that we seek to understand. Paul argued that quantum mechanics teaches us that belief in a fixed Cartesian distinction between subject and object is an unfounded prejudice of the classical worldview. The observer is part of the material composition of that which is being observed. The subject and object are causally entangled with each other and thus constantly co-perform co to reality. This is politicised by our subject position and discourse. There's two Niels Bohr quotes which I particularly like. 1. We must be clear that when it comes to atoms, language can be used only as in poetry. The poet too is not nearly so concerned with describing facts as with creating images and establishing mental connections. 
to. What is it that we humans depend on? We depend on our words. Our task is to communicate experience and ideas to others. We must strive continually to extend the scope of our description, but in such a way that our messages do not thereby lose their objective or unambiguous character. We are suspended in language in such a way that we cannot say what is up and what is down. The word reality is also a word, a word which we must learn to use correctly. I'm not sure I totally agree with him, but I think he must have had some understanding of the material effect of words. I write because I would like to be used for years after my death, says Adi Miles. Words are in no hierarchical position over anything else, but they are something. Why do I write poems? I write poems because I still want to fall in love. Sometimes in poetry you can invent new characters and new obsessions, or they can invent you, or language happens by accident. I don't know. Maybe it's not important at all, just living and being, and that's why we're infatuated. It's not really important. Franco Bifo Barati, in his book The Uprising on Poetry and Finance, says Financial power is based on the exploitation of precarious forms of labour, the general intellect in its present form of separation from the body. Only the conscious mobilisation of the erotic body of the general intellect, only the poetic revitalisation of language, will open the way to the emergence of a new form of social autonomy. If you strip away the pretentious language, incoherent logic and surface level analysis, then it's not such a bad argument. Financialization, especially as deregulated form, operates an abstraction of power into the ideal realm, like the exploitation of the bodies of the global labour force. This performs the same sort of Cartesian dualism as present throughout Enlightenment rationality, the difference between the mind and the body, the divine and the corporeal, the academic and the worldly. Roger Farquhar, in a text you recently shared with me, discusses a number of artists which I think are interesting or contemporary to this discussion, and in the discussion she specifically framed with the work within the work of Khan Barad, which she lists as Amalia Almond, Bunny Rogers, Megan Rooney, Justice Cicero, Holly White and Steve Rogenbach. Following this list, she writes, Some are artists poets, others just one or another, narrative cutting through their practices as objects, all have various research interests and different ways of conducting their practices. What is concurrent between them, however, is their embedded relationship between discursive and non-discursive practices. This embedded in between us through discursive and non-discursive practices challenges these presupposed binaries and enacts the form of material discursive performativity that Karen Barad extracts from Bohr's work on quantum mechanics. It's curious to think how challenging the separation between the mental and the bodily I challenge greater political and economic structures at a foundational level. It is in this sense that Bohr's belief in the materiality of language becomes interesting and literally incisive. I think what differentiates the practices of the people above named is their varying approaches to the same metric, creating and questioning an embedded interrelatedness between material and discursive fields. It will be interesting for critical discourse to map this as a political, social and aesthetic terrain. And then there's the question of why falling in love.